Well, with that video montage of what has been an extremely eventful year thus far, in fact, an extremely eventful last four years, it is my honor to welcome you to the Perth US Asia Center program on Indo-Pacific perspectives on the United States presidential election. I am delighted today to be welcomed by a number of leaders throughout our region here in the Indo-Pacific who have kindly agreed to join us to share their reactions to the news that we just watched and that we continue our living uh, at this point. Uh, we're going to be joined first and foremost by Ambassador Chan Heng Chi. She's the ambassador at large at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Singapore. Uh, she spent 16 years as Singapore's ambassador to Washington, D.C., functioning effectively as the dean of the diplomatic corps there. Uh, and she's not peripatetic. I would say she's omnipresent. And we're very fortunate to have her with us today to share her perspectives. Uh, I, we're hopeful that we're going to be joined by Ambassador Fujisaki Ichiro from, from Tokyo, Japan, who also served as Japan's ambassador to Washington, D.C., but he's still in the process of signing on right now. We'll let you know once we manage to secure him. We're also delighted to have uh, a close friend of the Perth U.S. Asia Centers and a frequent collaborator, Ambassador Dino Patti Jalal, who's the co-founder of the Foreign Policy Community Indonesia. He served as Deputy Foreign Minister for Indonesia, as well as uh, their ambassador to Washington, D.C., I think well known to audiences throughout the region, and we're delighted to have him with us. Uh, from India, we're, de we're welcomed by Ms. Suhasini Haidar, who is the diplomatic editor of The Hindu, one of India's oldest and most respected dailies. Uh, she is well known to audiences throughout the region from her long presence in both uh, print media and in, in broadcast media. She served as, as the anchor for CNN, IUCJ, IBN rather, as well as a correspondent for CNN International uh, and, and just had a, a wonderful op-ed released today in the Hindu looking at Indian perspectives on the election of, of Joe Biden to the US presidency. And then last but certainly not least, uh, back here at home, we're delighted to be joined by Melissa Babbage. Uh, Melissa is back from four years in Washington, D.C. She serves as vice chairman of the American Australian Association, uh, is currently director at, at Swiss RE, and has had a long career in finance, including at Deutsche Bank. And so we're delighted to have truly something that we hope to provide at the Perth U.S. Asia Center, which is a, a regional perspective on these developments. As we've seen in that short video montage as people were signing into this call, there is no shortage of information or perspectives about what's happening in Washington, D.C. We hope to provide uh, a little bit of value-added perspectives by instead of focusing on what's happening, by focusing on our regional reactions to that. So what I'd like to do is turning to this, this august panel we have, uh, and starting first with Ambassador uh, Chan Heng Chi, ask each of our panelists just to give us the reaction from their own national perspectives. So Ambassador, Ambassador Chan, could you tell us how these developments are being viewed in Singapore? Well, thank you, Gordon, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, well, let me say that I think we are relieved that, you know, the election has come to an end and there is, I think, a result. There's some clarity, although there are some challenges, but I believe there is clarity. Let me say that from Singapore's perspective, Singapore has always worked with both parties, Republicans and Democrats. And I'm not saying this as a diplomat, it's the truth. You know, because we started, for instance, a free trade agreement with the uh, Democratic President Bill Clinton. And it was actually carried out and negotiated fully under the Republican President George W. Bush. You know, so we've worked with Republicans and Democrats. And during the time of President Obama and uh, now with uh, President Trump, we maintain a solid and substantial relationship. In fact, we deepened our strategic framework agreement, which is a defense cooperation during the Trump administration. And we have uh, also deepened uh, defense cooperation in another way. We've also started negotiating the digital uh, economy uh, agreement. So we work well with the United States. That said, I think we are looking for a predictable and reliable power in the region. And we like our partners. We like the United States to be predictable and uh, reliable. And most of all, we want to see a stable US-China relationship. 
in the region because the US-China relationship is the most important bilateral relationship in the world and it impacts enormously on the entire region of East Asia, Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific. Ambassador Chan, wonderfully diplomatic as always. I must confess uh, the two words, uh, reliable and predictable, are probably not ones that people would broadly apply to the last four years, but they set a really interesting premise for our conversation going forward. Uh, we're going to turn next to, to Indonesia, Indonesian perspectives. Uh, Pak Dino, can we go over to you to get the reaction from, from Jakarta? Okay, good. So uh, I want to thank America for giving us great entertainment for the past uh, year or so. I stopped watching Netflix uh, <laughs> and listening to Spotify. It's really, uh, uh, you know, a lot of laughs, a lot of tears, uh, a lot of drama. So, so thank you for that. I'm going to miss that very much. Yeah, the whole family. <laughs> Uh, and secondly, uh, a response to U.S. elections, uh, there, 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 there are two kinds, yeah. Uh, on the public side, uh, yes, there is a relief, but uh, there hasn't been much uh, affection for President uh, Trump, yeah. Uh, I think this is particularly true among the Islamic community in Indonesia. And remember, there was a one million uh, people march uh, in, uh, in Indonesia and uh, by, by the Muslims uh, community to protest uh, against uh, Trump's uh, policies. And there has not been uh, you know, anything like that uh, for a while. So, so Trump uh, was, was a hard sell for, for Indonesia. Uh, but for the government, like what uh, Ambassador Henke said, you know, relations uh, are, for us, we maintain the relations. There's a strategic uh, partnership on paper at least. Uh, but uh, you can see that the U.S. diplomatic and political and economic capital in Indonesia has uh, declined. And, and the relations uh, under Obama was definitely not as close as uh, it was under, uh, sorry, under Trump was definitely not as close as under Obama. And this is uh, why Indonesians welcome uh, Biden presidency. You know, Trump was seen as not being friendly to Muslims, uh, but Biden, you know, he set a special message to the Islamic voters in the United States that went viral in Indonesia. And, uh, you know, Biden was seen as uh, the number two for Obama, which was seen as very uh, pro-Indo-Pacific, uh, pro, uh, you know, pro-Asia, uh, pro pro-Southeast Asia, and pro-Indonesia. Uh, so uh, there's, a, you know, there's a lot uh, that can be, uh, you know, utilized or harnessed uh, from, from that uh, in terms of uh, Biden presidency's relationship with uh, Southeast Asia, and, uh, including with Indonesia. Thank you. Uh, Surasini, uh, President Trump had another high-profile visit to Delhi, and, and likewise, uh, Prime Minister Modi was uh, engaged in a, in a Howdy Modi big rally there in Texas. So India is a little bit different. Could you kind of give us the perspective uh, from Delhi? Um, sure. And uh, while there will be some similarities, you know, the idea that um, uh, Mr. Trump was unpredictable, um, uh, as in general, I would say that there is a, a feeling that is not very negative towards Mr. Trump uh, uh, as he goes out. Look, at the end of the day, the idea that uh, relations are bipartisan on both sides, regardless of who comes to power in India, and regardless of who comes to power in the U.S., Strategic ties have actually grown year on year for the last 20 years. Uh, we haven't seen them walk back at all. Um, uh, but even so, the election result is a bit of a mixed bag for the government in New Delhi, the Narendra Modi, Modi government, as you pointed out. On the one hand, uh, Mr. Modi himself personally invested in the relationship. There was a lot of phone calls between him and Mr. Trump, uh, four events in the last year. And remember, this is election year in the US. So uh, normally not according to protocol uh, to have such, uh, such a deep investment with the government in Washington. But even so, we saw a rally in Houston. We saw a rally in, um, in, uh, in Gujarat, in Ahmedabad in February this year, just a few months before. Uh, we also saw ties with the Democrats strain uh, uh, a little bit because of, you know, the external affairs minister, uh, you know, snubbing the Democrats, uh, refusing to go to a House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, we saw Mr. Pompeo make his last visit, as he did to Indonesia as well, just a week.
before elections, which internally was seen as more or less a, a signal that the government somehow thought that this government uh, would be re-elected. Uh, it's also true that Mr. Trump's nativist platform, majoritarian policies match uh, at present with the policies of the current government uh, in India. And finally, Mr. Trump was good for India on, uh, on a whole bunch of things. Uh, the Indo-Pacific that he put a lot of uh, investment into in the last year, um, he was tough on Pakistan, uh, which always goes down well in India. Uh, he really was tough on China, particularly at a time when India is, uh, is facing the kind of aggression that we are at the line of actual control. This made a big difference. And finally, India was a beneficiary of the fact uh, that Mr. Uh, Trump didn't put his traditional alliances first. Uh, you know, the U.S. was open to dealing with all kinds of countries with, that weren't traditional allies. Uh, and in a sense, India was a beneficiary of that and, and liked the fact that Mr. Trump did not have this uh, interventionist policy. In fact, uh, he, he ended America's wars, if you like, in many spheres rather than uh, start any new ones. So I know that's not normally what is seen in, in so many other parts of the world. On the other hand, uh, India does have a lot to look forward to with Mr. Biden. Um, the government or New Delhi, the establishment has dealt with Mr. Biden for decades now. You know, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Vice President of the US, he was sent out especially to look at Afghanistan policy. Uh, he's likely to have less sudden starts. He's not gonna call up one day and say, I'm withdrawing India's GSP exporter status as Mr. Trump did. Uh, and most importantly, he's likely to rejoin the multilateral structure. This is what Mr. Biden wrote in an article in Foreign Policy earlier this year, restore US leadership and possibly rejoin all the things Mr. Trump walked out from. Although I don't know if he'll have the time to do them, but UNESCO, Human Rights Council, WHO, rejoining Paris uh, Climate Accord will help India, rejoining the Iran uh, nuclear negotiations again will ease things for India in the region. I think. Uh, broadly, India will welcome the return to old fashioned values, if you like, uh, that Mr. Biden represents the democratic values, but will be prickly about the US taking any kind of intrusive uh, interest uh, towards India's own domestic, uh, you know, democratic issues, uh, issues with Kashmir, alleged human rights violations, uh, laws that have been controversial and all the rest. Well, thank you, and I'm delighted we were able to work out the technical difficulties, and, and we're now joined by Ambassador Fujisaki Ichiro, who uh, serves as president of the Nakasone Peace Institute, had been ambassador in Washington, D.C. as well, as well as being a distinguished professor at Sophia University. So, Ambassador Fujisaki, what we're asking is just a short uh, reaction from Japan I know. as uh, Japanese perspectives on the election. Uh, we are very happy that the uh, U.S. would be coming back as a worldly leader, and that's very important for us. And uh, we're very uh, happy that there's not too much violence and uh, because the US should be uh, a role model for democracy. Uh, now, very frankly, uh, if, if uh, Mr. Trump had won, uh, we would say, hey, uh, uh, glad to uh, work with you for next four years. And uh, if Mr. Biden is coming back, uh, we'd say, uh, 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 it's nice to work with you because it's American people's decision. It's not ours. So I was always saying it's like a Christmas gift. Uh, uh, we don't open the box till, and we don't say anything till the day we open the box and cry out, oh, this is just what I wanted. That's the only solution. So we are very happy. And uh, one thing, uh, it's uh, Henchi is a very big sister for all of us. So... Uh, uh, I feel uh, like a little uh, brother talking back to my uh, big sister, but uh, when I heard her, I think she missed one word, firm attitude. I think, uh, uh, of course, we uh, need uh, US-China stability, but also, I think, uh, for human rights, for values, uh, democracy, I think firm attitude that U.S. has been taken should be appreciated as well. And I think uh, that is something we would uh, continue to, uh, uh, that the Americans would take uh, uh, that attitude. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you. Now we're going to turn to you, Melissa. You've had a rather unique experience on this panel and that uh, all the rest of us uh, are somewhat removed from Washington. You've spent the last four years there. I uh, have a, both a business kind of view on some of these issues, given your role as, as vice chair of the American Australian Association, but you are now back in, in, in Sydney. So could you kind of characterize the, the Australian reaction to the, to the results that we're watching right now? So a quick thank you, Gordon, um, and it's great to be on the panel with such esteemed um, colleagues. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. I think from the Australian, the perspective of the Australian public, there is also the um, relief that we seem to have some clarity and, and some form of result. I think there is a great curiosity from the Australian public and probably some assumptions too as to you know, what the domestic cultural landscape might evolve into or might look like over the next few years. And whether that, in fact, will bear out or not, I think is something to be seen. Um, there is perhaps, um, you know, some, some not uh, deep enough understanding of just the, def the difference in the, in the demographics of the US. Um, and the closeness really of the result. I mean, it's um, 4 million votes or something, um, you know, really does, um, uh, you know, speak to uh, some of those kind of differences and divides across the, the United States. So that's something I think that as a, from a domestic perspective, the, 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 the ordinary Australian, if you want to put it that way, is, um, is really interested to see how that plays out. I think from a national perspective, obviously, we continue to have the willingness to work from the foundation of shared values. Um, that's really important. It's been ever thus, and it will continue to be, uh, be that way. The values, the belief systems are very, very important. Um, like a couple of the other panellists have mentioned, um, I think, again, from a national perspective, we would have... Um, an expectation and, and probably a hope for greater multilateral uh, engagement from the US. Um, we definitely need, I think, support through the various alliances and the various multilateral uh, bodies in order to really embed a rules-based operating model for the Indo-Pacific. So we, we, we look forward to kind of developments in the, that area. For example, um, you know, from an Australian perspective, we obviously hope that a body like the WTO um, will get the support it needs to again be effective as the world's primary um, trade referee. So I think there's some of the, the, the main, uh, you know, thinking from a national perspective. And also, um, one of the other panellists had mentioned um, we would see that perhaps the Biden administration will um, look more closely at issues around um, human rights and, you know, potentially how that impacts um, supply chains, um, you know, throughout the, throughout the region. And those supply chains obviously are, are form a really critical part of the relationship um, with the United States going forward. So, yeah, that's just a few of the the, the thoughts that are, I think, swirling around uh, our well, nation at the moment. Thank you so much. Uh, as, as to underline this kind of first series of questions, it's quite interesting to me that despite the fact that uh, President Trump has yet to concede, uh, yeah, after the, the US networks had all called the election, every one of the countries that are joining our panel today, so uh, Indonesia, Japan, India, Australia, and Singapore, have all had national leaders who have reached out in public and congratulated uh, the president-elect Joe Biden and his running mate, uh, Kamala Harris. And so that in, in itself kind of underlines so many of the comments that we've already just heard thus far. Now, um, one of the challenges the United States is facing right now is that it is still in the middle of a pandemic. In fact, a pandemic that appears to be peaking right during the election. If I understand correctly, today alone, there were 134,000 new cases of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and it does seem that any incoming administration, so when the Biden administration does take power, which seems to be three long months away right now, they're gonna be overwhelmed with the enormity of the challenges in terms of health, in terms of economic recovery. 
And, and I, I can't help but reflect back a number of years ago, uh, I had the honor of serving on the Asia advisory team uh, in a minor role at the time for the Obama campaign in 2008. Uh, and at the time, Ambassador Chan Heng Chi hosted a, a large number of people from the campaign to discuss the events during the course of the campaign where we're looking at. And the conclusion we all had at that point was the United States facing this 2008 financial crisis was not going to have the bandwidth for foreign policy. And in some respects, that proved to be true, right? The, the first focus was on rebuilding you know, the economy domestically. Uh, we're likely to face a similar situation uh, right now where the U.S. is going to be focusing on rebuilding strength at home. So in that context, I want to go back to our panelists and ask you uh, from a Singaporean perspective, an Indonesian perspective, Indian, Japanese, or Australian perspective, if you were to be giving advice to a very distracted Biden administration uh, that has dealing with a lot of other issues, what are the issues that you would like to see them focus on as a priority to strengthen relations with Singapore, Indonesia, India, Japan, Australia in turn? So, Ambassador Chai, we're going to return to you, if you could. Uh, thank you, Gordon. Gordon, before I go to your question, there's one point that I would like to uh, make, which I don't think any of us made in the first round, but I think it's very important. And that is between now and January 20th, I hope, you know, nothing too excitable or exciting happens, you know, and there are not too many initiatives that have to be unwound. And that is, uh, I think, a real concern, you know, what could, you know, be done, which would be difficult to undo. Now, putting that aside, what would we like to see sorted out? You are absolutely right to say that and in fact, Joe Biden, in the article that Suhasini Sini, uh, referred to, he wrote a piece on foreign policy in, um, in, foreign, po in uh, foreign affairs, where he, he, it's very clear the focus is domestic, domestic concerns, you know. And I think that will happen, and he will have to make COVID and the recovery from COVID his first priority. So foreign policy is not going to be front and center. And I would say I'm very realistic and Southeast Asia is really not going to be front and center. So my message is please, you know, put some attention to Southeast Asia. You know, I think uh, bearing in mind that foreign policy is a little harder to carry through. It is important that the United States make sure that you have officials appointed because during the Trump administration, there weren't many officials appointed to fill in the slots to carry on the business of the state. That it was very thin, the State Department and other departments too. Now, hopefully, if you have people staffed in different uh, departments, ministries for us, you can at least get business done at different levels. So that would be very important. I think in Asia, we place great emphasis on being there. You have to be there. And I do not know how the Trump administration is going to carry this when they are so absorbed at home. But it is important to have an exchange of visits to understand our perspectives. During these four years, I'm not sure many of us were getting our views through sufficiently. No, we did things, but does the United States really have a feel of what the people in our region want? So it's very important for American officials and even American business, I would say. They should play it as a whole of government, you know, come together and understand what the region wants. Asia, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia. Meet and exchange to build the relationship I think the United States must make up its mind to attend the summits that they are, in fact, a member of. The East Asian Summit, APEC, you know, ARF, et cetera. Um, not just summits, but other meetings. So be present at the meetings. We will work with, on climate change with the United States, and we will work on the pandemic, a global health security matter. I think we can all work on that. We would like to work on trade, and we would like to see the United States come back to trade in a big way. But I do understand it is harder 
you know, the CPTPP and would the United States come back to it? And I know there are some obstacles. We took out 22 provisions, you know, and uh, for the US to come back, do you insist the 22 provisions be brought back to CPTPP? I think those are questions that we would be interested. I can go on, but I better let others have a say. But so we'll work on climate change. We want attention on foreign affairs, but we know how hard it is going to be. Look at climate change, global health security, and if you can, and I know trade is not a priority, but you have to start looking at trade. Well, thank you. I mean, and it's a wonderful reminder that international relations ultimately are about relationships. Uh, and one of the first questions I think that everyone in this panel is going to be looking at is to who is going to be filling these key positions in the Biden administration, because that was one of the things that I think Ambassador Chan has rightly pointed out that characterized the last four years, just a remarkably thin bench in terms of people in those positions. So that's very helpful. So, Pakdino, we're going to go over to you from an Indonesian perspective. If you were to, to give advice and you're never shy about these things, what what would you like Washington to be focusing on? What should Jakarta be doing to strengthen that bilateral relationship? Well, first, I'm sure the rest of the world understands that Biden has to get COVID-19 and the economy under control. He does not want to be like Bush 41, successful on foreign policy, and then got defeated at home because of uh, economic conditions. And on, I think on foreign policy, uh, Biden can take advantage of the fact that many of the foreign policy wonks that refused to work for President Trump, you know, they signed that petition. Uh, I don't know if you signed that as well, uh, Gordon. But, uh, you know, these guys are all up for grabs and they can uh, quickly move in into foreign policy mm -hmm. structure. Uh, but I, I, I do want to point out that, uh, look, uh, if the United States wants to uh, increase uh, its influence and role uh, in the Indo-Pacific and Southeast Asia, I agree with the Heng Chi. You gotta, you gotta play the part, right? Uh, I remember a conversation uh, with uh, uh, the late uh, Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew. You know, I was the note taker, and my president was speaking to him. And his point was, look, in the relationship between nations, economics uh, is is very important. Economics is the weight of that relationship, right? And you can see that in Indonesia's case, for example, uh, U.S.-Indonesia trade has remained stagnant for about a decade at about 26 to 29 billion. Whereas with China is already 70 billion and soon reaching 100 billion, right? So US-Indonesia uh, trade is one third of uh, China, right? And that uh, reveals to you that the United States has to step up the game on, on, on trade, on investment, uh, and, and education, uh, technology, and, and other things, right? So uh, I think, you know, my point is, uh, look, there's a Biden presidency, but it's not automatic that the United States will have a seat on the table the way it had before. Uh, you have to re-earn that place at the table, right? You got to be present. You got to come up with uh, policies that, uh, you know, engage and lead, uh, you know, the countries in the region. Uh, and so on and so on, right? Uh, so it's not going to be automatic. Uh, there's got to be some work uh, that, that has to be put into it. Fantastic. Well, one of the advantages and disadvantages of living in Perth, the farthest city on the planet on land away from Washington, D.C., is that despite the many never Trump letters, I was never even asked to sign on to one. So we're a little bit out of sight, out of line down here in that process. Uh, we're going to turn to you next, Suhasini, from, from, from India's perspective. Uh, what, what, what would you be urging uh, in terms of focus and priorities? Sure, and of course, Gordon, with the disclaimer, unlike uh, so many of the distinguished panelists, I'm a journalist, so I'm not even sure uh, my own side would, uh, would take my recommendation. Um, but uh, I, I will say that I agree with Ambassador Chan completely. I don't know how quickly foreign policy can become a real priority for Mr. Biden, given the domestic challenges he faces and the need to deal with uh, the, the vast polarization that we have seen, not just in the election, but in terms of what is following now with, um, with Mr. Trump still uh, hesitant to concede, if you like. So I would say pluck the low hanging fruit when it comes to foreign policy and particularly for India, US policies, I would say there are a lot of 
uh, low-hanging fruit that uh, Mr. Biden could look at. One is to conclude some kind of, of a mini trade deal. This has been uh, the subject of negotiations between the U.S. trade representative and the Indian commerce minister for more than a year, in fact, two years or so. Uh, they haven't gotten anywhere, but we keep hearing that they're close. Uh, so a little bit of flexibility on both sides would produce a, a mini trade deal, which will make a difference. The second, and I say this because I'm not a diplomat, there must be U.S. clarity on China. Uh, the world cannot be sitting around waiting for that next tweet to come that says, uh, you know, today <laughs> I'm on good terms with China. Today, I, I think Mr. Xi is a great guy. The next day, you know, China is going to pay and all the rest of that. Um, we are all too invested in the United States and invested in China. And, uh, you know, Ambassador Dino really did put out uh, the kind of investment comparisons and those comparisons exist for all of Asia. Uh, to be uh, to be swinging like some pendulum and deciding, uh, you know, what to do about policies depending on where the U.S. is. So the U.S. should be clear where they want to go. Are they looking for more brinkmanship of the kind we saw in the Trump administration? Are we looking at uh, possibilities of a resolution to uh, the the U.S. Um, uh, uh, you know problems with China right now? I think that is something that uh, that will make a big difference uh, to India and to others in Asia. I think the, uh, because Gordon didn't say who those recommendations were to specifically, I would say that for the Indian government, it is necessary to start uh, reaching out institutionally to the U.S. rather than falling back into some of the personality driven uh, style we have seen of pushing ties, you know, the hugs, the rallies and all the rest of that. And to really look now at a Biden administration uh, as, no, as the anti-Trump, if you like, uh, where you are not going to get as far by doing the, the just the personal thing. Uh, I think India should be prepared for dealing with sensitive issues and to have frank conversations as democracies do with each other on those issues. And finally, and I forgot this in the low hanging fruit I was talking about, Mr. Biden needs to make, a, a, you know, put out the, the statement of American openness a little more clearly. This doesn't have to mean more visas or easier visas because everybody understands it's particularly in a post-COVID world, we're looking at much uh, uh, clo more closed uh, environments for migration. Uh, but the U.S. stands to lose its soft power if it looks like a forbidding or unwelcoming country to the rest of the world, where it is seen, as Mr. Biden put it, uh, uh, at its best, it is seen as a beacon for the world. Um, so I would say that's another low-hanging fruit, which will be appreciated very much in New Delhi as well. Thank you. Uh, Ichiro, Japan has the, the double whammy of dealing with a relatively new prime minister, but also this upcoming change of government here. What would you focus on in terms of that bilateral relationship? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Gordon, son, the uh, most boring panel, I think, is that where panelists all agree. <laughs> so I'll, it uh, may sound like a devil's advocate, but I'd like to uh, challenge uh, what uh, Chan Henchi said and what uh, Haidarsan said, I'm quite optimistic about uh, the foreign policy side. Of course, uh, the first issue is COVID-19, but uh, one, uh, four reasons. One, he had been foreign chairman of foreign relations committee for so long. That's his priority has been, he knows people, he has all the expertise, uh, Iran deal, uh, TPP, everything. Point two, in order to compete, I don't say confront, but compete with Russia and China and those countries, you need like-minded countries. And I think Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, you call it Asia-Pacific or whatever, uh, is, will continue to be very important. And I think he will uh, try to reach out to allies and like-minded countries. Third, I think because uh, this administration, not like Trump administration, would like to do the team play, not only him, the leader, but uh, others, state uh, secretary or a national security advisor or USTR, all would play uh, the game. And uh, so playing the t uh, team play will be the uh, element. And uh, a lot of us, uh, Chan Henchi or uh, Gordon Sun or uh, Dino Sun, you know all these players uh, on the uh, Democratic Party. Uh, the fourth reason, I think, would be that it was during the exactly Obama administration that trade 
ASEAN Secretariat, the representative in Jakarta, and uh, uh, they know, and they were coming to ASEAN Summit, uh, unlike uh, Mr. Trump. So I think uh, uh, we could be uh, uh, optimistic. Now, one thing I would like uh, United States to do is uh, uh, they have to know that it, they are elephant. Uh, uh, she's an elephant. So we want a uh, quiet w w walk, uh, not the dancing around. Uh, because uh, we all need uh, predictability, stability, and I think uh, we can uh, expect that on the uh, Biden team uh, more than uh, tr uh, what we are seeing with the Trump team. And uh, we have a new prime minister and he's going to establish good relations with the new president. So he, as, as you just sent a cable right away and uh, looking forward to, I think if it, if it was Mr. Abe, he was very good in establishing good relations, excellent relations with uh, Mr. Trump, but maybe Mr. Trump would have, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Abe may have uh, hesitated to sending a message today or uh, uh, yesterday uh, too early, but uh, uh, that was possible. And I think uh, we look forward to uh, making good relations. And I think uh, foreign relations uh, would be very important element for the uh, new team. And especially in the Pacific region, Asia Pacific region, this is the growth center. Thanks Thank you. Uh, Sorry for well, a long talk. Hey, no, no, not at all. Melissa, I mean, arguably, Australia has probably managed uh, the admittedly challenging relationships with the Trump administration better than any other U.S. ally in the world. If you look at Canada or NATO or you know, disputes over funding with South Korea or even in Japan. Um, and so that bilateral relationship has remained remarkably strong and well managed by the, the last several governments in Australia. Th that makes the, the question of what next a little bit more difficult. How do you view that? Everything that you said is true, um, but I think if we look to the future, uh, we start from a really solid platform. And, and like I said previously, you know, we start from a very solid base of um, shared values. And of course, the Five Eyes Security Partnership is, you know, a very important part of the relationship. Now, President Biden has had actually more um, engagement with Australia than uh, had had President Trump, of course, when he won. Um, President Biden had visited many, many times and there's lots of engagement with Australian officials and, and you know, through uh, many different iterations of, of ministries and so forth. And also uh, President-elect Biden's uh, team, his administration is likely to include many people that would have engaged with Australia already in, you know, in various capacities. We don't know who exactly that might be, but for example, Jeff Bleich, the former US ambassador to Australia might be engaged in the new administration. Uh, Michelle Flournoy from a defense perspective. There are some, you know, uh, longstanding um, personal relationships um, with with Australia, um, not not notwithstanding that you know that the current government and and governments of all iterations have shown themselves over time to be able to form good and deep relationships uh, with the United States. I think in terms of um, you know strengthening relations, I agree with everything that has been said around the domestic focus, and I think about well, what does President-elect Biden want his legacy to be and without being so presumptuous as to put thoughts into his head or think that I have some su super insight but two things that are quite obvious one is climate change and the other of course is what he himself has termed the soul of the nation and I think from the climate change perspective I do think that you know that will be one of the early pillars of re-engagement if we want to call it re-engagement um, in uh, the multilateral kind of field, um, and that is um, the Paris Accord, and so that is something that um, we we will need to work with uh, with the US uh, on that accord. Um, and so, whilst the president and and his team, the administration will be caught up for a while 
looking at the COVID, um, the domestic economic issues. I, I always am very optimistic about the US and its ability to um, recover from its domestic um, e economic kind of situation. And so I think, you know, I th so I do think there will be some focus around President-elect Biden and his own thinking about, you know, what, what do I want to achieve uh, as president? And for sure, you know, there are aspects that are, um, that are globally um, significant. We need to keep, from an Australian perspective, you know, we need to keep embedding um, things like the developments in the Five Eyes um, partnerships. We, we need, it's, you know, it's gone deeper into other industries, including critical minerals and supply chains, and we need to keep embedding this. Um, and we also, you know, need to, I think, um, continue to work through the quad um, in a very constructive fashion. And so those aspects of foreign policy, um, I think are uh, in, important and, and we, where we will be continuing to work to strengthen our relations and keep them on, on, the, on the good foundation that, that we, we, we do have. Well, thank you. Well, if I can make an observation, one of the underlying presumptions by using big terms like initially Asia Pacific or our favorite term here, sitting here in Australia's Indian Ocean capital, the Indo-Pacific, um, is that the issues that we discuss no longer are things that can be handled individually or even bilaterally. And so it was interesting to me that almost to a person as we went through our panel and we talked about what needed to be bilaterally, the conversation quickly strayed into the regional or even the global, whether it was participation in, in, in fora such as the East Asia Summit or re resumption of the Trans-Pacific Partnership or leadership on trade or leadership on climate change or leadership on health. Uh, the, the, the bilateral requires the regional. So I wanna kind of wrap up on that. We've just got a little over 10 minutes left, but I wanna take a moment to step back and say, okay. Uh, and again, Melissa did a wonderful job of kind of saying, all right, what, is, what, is it, what does he want his legacy to be? So let me kind of frame it that way. If we look at this broad um, uh, enterprise, which is you know an expansive, additive, positive narrative, how do we incorporate India into the Asia Pacific? How do we build an Indo-Pacific, which is based on uh, what Australians will refer to as a rules-based order, the rule of law, where we're expanding trade? There's a lot of challenges we've already put out on the table there. Uh, by the end of this year, uh, we'll have a regional cooperative economic partnership agreement signed where the United States is not part of it, right? So I'm kind of curious, uh, let me just kind of rephrase that last question a little bit differently. If we have a vision for the region, for the Indo-Pacific uh, in the next four years, what do we want the U.S. role to be in that region? What do we want the U.S. role or perhaps legacy four years hence to be in the Indo-Pacific? So uh, Hank Chi, we're going to go back to you at the very top again, if we could. You know, um, Gordon, I think that one of the things the United States must be aware of, and the region is certainly very aware of, is that things have, are different now. A lot of things have changed. The world has changed, and we are moving into a multipolar world. The United States had a bipolar world, then it was a unipolar world, and it's, you know, sort of a unipolar in the Asia Pacific. But I think that is changing. It's multipolar, but at the moment, it is asymmetrical multipolar. Asymmetrical a pole being the United States. But China is catching up soon, and India wants to catch up too. Japan wants to play a role, Australia wants to play a role, so it's a multipolar world. And so the United States needs to come in and talk to people, talk to the countries. They all have their ideas. The Indo-Pacific idea was pushed, but you know, at the last Indo-Pacific meet, the countries all had very different ideas, and I don't think they had the same view, and I think there wasn't a communicate. You know, some countries wanted an inclusive Indo-Pacific. Australia thinks of Indo-Pacific Pacific more inclusively. It's not to exclude any country. So I think, you know, the United States has to come in. You can lead or co-lead with everybody, but to form 
an Asia Indo Pacific community where we all wanted rules based, but better when you talk to everybody and don't try containment because nobody in Asia wants the US to force us to choose. Once you talk of choosing, nobody wants to play that game. So I would say these are some of the changes and I think that could be the legacy and Biden could do that because I think the United States would like to work with China where they can, cooperate with China where they can and confront where they must. But there's room for working together. And I think that's the legacy. Thank you. Dino, over to you. Um, you know, now the flavor of the day is uh, Indo-Pacific, right? I, I, I'm just a bit worried if Indo-Pacific is uh, being framed as a US-led uh, movement. Uh, then it's going to be uh, harder to find traction uh, in, the, in the region yeah? because we see how there's a lot of regional designs uh, in the region, the East Asia Summit, uh, you know, uh, RCEP and, and other things. It all happens because uh, it's not being pushed by one major power, right? Um, so so that, that, that's just uh, one thing. The uh, United States can promote it, but uh, I agree with Heng Chi. Uh, the, you have to know when you don't have you don't have to be in the front lead, yeah. And secondly, I think uh, it's important for the U.S. Uh, to be seen as a, a solution provider to the challenges of of the region. Um, you know, this is how China has uh, gained some traction because China has been seen uh, more uh, as a solution uh, provider on some issues, right? And, and that's why their diplomatic uh, capital has has. Uh, uh, increase uh, in the recent years. And, and the United States has uh, to also project and present itself uh, in the same way, right? Uh, and I think if it does that, uh, you know, I don't know if it's about connectivity, infrastructure, uh, and, and other issues, uh, then, then the, I think uh, President Biden's uh, foreign policy will be in, in the stronger hands. Yeah. I would note that despite my funny Arizona accent sitting here in Perth as I am, one of the, the advantages of a panel like this is it's not driven out of Washington, D.C., and we're able to bring together perspectives from Japan and India and Australia, which have long had Indo-Pacific policies, to Singapore, which has been greatly facilitative of all the dialogues in this region, and, of course, Indonesia, which recently led uh, the, the formation of a, an ASEAN Indo-Pacific outlook. And so we appreciate that very much. Suhasini, over to you. Um, well, you know, Gordon, I, uh, in, the remarks on this uh, panel really reflect that we are all thinking on the same lines and the same concerns. I, I do think Mr. Biden, if he is looking to uh, build this Indo-Pacific, uh, you know, as a region that, that is cohesive, uh, needs to think out of the box a little bit, maybe even take a leaf, dare I say it, from the Trump book. Because uh, there are things that Mr. Trump did in terms of non-traditional structures uh, that, uh, that a future administration could learn from cooperation between Indo-Pacific countries and the U.S. that we haven't seen before in, in this particular format. Uh, you have uh, things like the Five Eye meeting that included a few others. Uh, including India uh, uh, more recently. And again, these are ways of thinking out of the box if you do want to come closer to this and bring this region together. The second, uh, and I think Ambassador Dino put it very well, uh, that, uh, that there must be an, a, a US alternative. So far, we have spoken about the Indo-Pacific and particularly if you look at the India, US, Japan, Australia, the Quad, uh, it has uh, really focused on the strategic, on the military, uh, exchanges on the on the uh, on, on the exercises we've seen as well uh, that have started, uh, but they have to look at the second part, which is giving a cogent, comprehensive, sustainable alternative to, to countries in the region that genuinely need to develop, that genuinely need infrastructural uh, investment, uh, but aren't seeing any alternatives. The U.S., you know, uh, had the much touted idea of the Blue Dot Network Initiative. But frankly, besides being a Michelin rating sort of agency, uh, it didn't really go far in terms of, you know, putting up, putting your money where your mouth is, if you like. So I think uh, there must be a greater push 
towards actually making the idea that the alternatives will will work and will count. Uh, the supply chain resilience program that uh, that Japan, Australia, and India are part of uh, the initiative uh, is going to have some traction for the moment. But again, uh, as uh, as other panelists have said, it in a world where the RCEP is ratified. I think we are going to see trading, uh, uh, you know, lines really moving towards the, the RCEP, uh, you know, internally for the RCEP countries. India has decided to walk out of that. I don't know, I, I don't foresee a future in which India walks back in. Uh, but the truth is that that is going to become an almost primary trading relationship or architecture. Uh, and, and so I, I'd like to see how these other alternatives would work and what the US plans to do in terms of rejoining any trading structure. And, and finally, and I can't put it uh, better than, uh, uh, you know, Ambassador Fujisaki already did, uh, if the US is going to be the elephant in the room in all conversations of the Indo-Pacific, uh, then don't do the dancing <laughs> because, uh, you know, the, the world doesn't need for the US to move faster or to think faster than the other partners in this region when it comes to what to do about this region. Um, and, you know, we don't need the US to come and create more conflict points. We need the US uh, in this region to, uh, to, uh, to show that there are alternatives to build that free and open Indo-Pacific, the rules-based order, but to encourage it in a, in a, in a more positive way is, is where I'd leave it. Oh, fantastic. Well, we're nearing the top of the hour, but I want to make sure that we get in some final observations, both from, from Japan and Australia. So, so Ichiro, over to you for any final comments that you might have. Uh, thank you very much. I sometimes uh, do agree with uh, Henchi, and I think uh, USB there, that's the most important thing. But uh, one thing I would like to say is that the uh, US should be uh, confident of its assertion that, and uh, I would like them to hold the banner as high. Uh, the rule of law, that's the most important thing. I do not want US to become one of them and follow the steps of China. Uh, Chinese uh, solution uh, provider, no, that's not what we would like to see. And uh, as for dancing, uh, Haider-san said, uh, uh, Trump was uh, playing the music of uh, salsa or uh, <laughs> Uh, tango and said, hey, let's dance this uh, like a disc jockey. We would like uh, to now to uh, dance uh, uh, blues or waltz uh, very quietly. And that's what we would like to see. Now, last thing I would like to say is that uh, what the legacy of not uh, Biden, but uh, Trump, is that uh, he has shown to us that nearly 50% of Americans are following the Trump uh, uh, religion or Trumpist, they are uh, Trumpists. So we have to be very careful in treating them. We shouldn't uh, push uh, them too far it's, uh, from time to time. We'd like them to come back to TPP, but that's not possible. I think we should wait. It was a bit scary uh, looking at the uh, election result that uh, unlike a lot of uh, pollsters said, uh, 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 Trump was uh, fighting a very good fight and uh, it was a bit scary. So we need uh, to, uh, Democrats, either Republicans who are more moderate to continue for, uh, even after Biden. That was what I was thinking. Thank you very much. You know, after the last few weeks of the campaign, I'm still trying to get images of President Trump dancing out of my head. And I'm not sure that I want images of President like Biden dancing in my head either. So we might, we might leave it somewhere. Melissa, over to you from final comments. Yes, so just very quickly, um, I think that, again, we ask ourselves the question, um, what, what role, what is the role and what, why do we want US engagement in the region? And I think we want it because of um, values, rule of law, um, frameworks, kind of foundations. We uh, understand the development needs uh, within the region. We think the US has a role to play in that. As Australians, we think that we need to continue, you know, to be helpful in the Pacific in particular through investment and foreign aid. I, I think we're all really just seeking this kind of new equilibrium um, and maybe competitive coexistence 
um, with the bigger players in the region. And we, you know, we continue to believe that um, very strongly that um, it is the frameworks that we're able to put in place in the region that um, that that really set will, will set that up um, going forward. So thank you. This has been an extremely rich discussion, and we are very grateful that that experienced diplomats, journalists, opinion leaders, business leaders from from Japan, from Singapore, from Indonesia, from India, and Australia have been willing to join us for this conversation. One of the disadvantages of the COVID era is we can't have you all here with us in person in Perth, but had we done that, I think we might have been distracted one by the beaches, uh, and we were likely would have had an in-person event that was stopped here today. One of the advantages of this Zoom format is that the real audience for our discussion is likely asleep right now in Washington, DC. Yes. And so we're confident that when we are able to release a recording of this discussion uh, and share it with our colleagues back in Washington, DC, there will be intense interest on the learned perspectives that we've had around the table today. So on behalf of, of all of us here at the Perth US Asia Center and us broadly in the Indo-Pacific region, I'd like to thank each of our panelists for your time, for your insights, uh, and say that I think probably collectively there is a, there is a sense of optimism in the air. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done. We, we've done a pretty good job of identifying it, uh, but as a region, uh, it is our great pleasure uh, to be part of this region and working together with all of you. So thank you. Uh, we look forward to engaging with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you.